Welcome all to this uh, SIB virtual uh, computational biology seminar. Uh, today we have the pleasure to uh, host Daniel Marbach from the SIB computation, uh, computational biology group uh, of the computational biology department of the University of Lausanne. Daniel got his PhD in computer science and computational biology in 2009 at EPFL, and then from 2009 to 2013 he uh, continues research uh, with a postdoctoral fellowship from uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation at the Manolis Kelly's group uh, from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard in the US. And since 2013, he's back to Europe and is now a senior researcher at the Department of Computational Biology here in Lausanne. Um, so the over uh, arching aim, aim of his work is to develop uh, novel methodologies and software tools to uh, um, integrate in large-scale molecular genetic and clinical data to unravel genomic, genomic networks, discover disease pathways and biomarkers, and build predictive models of disease processes. Um, in, the re in the recently published work, uh, Daniel created the most comprehensive resources for cell type and tissue specific gene regulatory circuits to date. And he found that genetic variants associated with complex disorders disrupt pathways in disease specific tissues. And over the past eight years, uh, Daniel further led CrowdSource's open data competition in systems biology and personalized medicine as part of the, as the, as part of the dream challenges. And um, today, Daniel will take us through some of his work and explain to us the disease mod mod module identification dream challenge. So, Daniel, thanks again for accepting this invitation, and the floor is yours. Thanks for the invitation. <clears throat> okay, so I will uh, briefly, for those who don't know, introduce the dream challenges. Um, I will go through this first part very quickly. Also, of our previous work that Diana mentioned in the introduction on tissue-specific networks, I will go over this very quickly as I presented it here in Lausanne recently. But um, it forms kind of the background and motivation then that led to this challenge that we uh, launched um, this summer. I will give a brief introduction to pathway and module analysis and present the challenge and results. So, to the dream challenges. So, reproducibility in biomedical research is an issue. Uh, several studies have shown that lots of uh, published work is not reproducible. Problems are that data is often not shared and that researchers are forced to evaluate their own methods in their publication, leading to a situation that basically everybody presents the new best method. And uh, what I call the self thing filling prophecy that often in computational biology high value data is generated and then paired with some method and a high profile uh, publication results and then this method starts to become uh, widely used but maybe there are other um, uh, very uh, valuable methods in more technical journals that maybe don't get this visibility but would be uh, better or, or um, a forgiven problem. So, uh, what if I would tell you that we can actually have a way to openly share data, pre-publication, and objectively, transparently assess methods and build collaborative communities in the process. And so these open community challenges are a way to achieve these goals. Um, so it's, uh, this shows the basic structure of these DREAM challenges and also other similar open data challenges. In DREAM, uh, we used a lot of clinical data recently in the last year, so you usually have a ground truth. In this example, you may have some clinical data from cases and controls. So now this data, instead of locking it up and making a publication, it's crowdsourced. It's made freely available to the community, and anybody interested can now apply met their methods and submit predictions, which are evaluated rigorously because the participants don't have access to the ground truth. So that's the basic structure of these challenges. Um, the DREAM initiative has been founded by Gustavo and Andrea um, back in 2006. Uh, Gustavo was the main driver over these years. In 2013, there was a big uh, momentum with uh, Sage Bionetworks joining. So now it's together with uh, Sage Bionetworks um, 
Stephen Friend uh, uh, is the, the, the leader there. He now joined Apple, but he was the, the president and founder of Sage Bio Networks, and they developed Synapse, which is a collaborative platform that is now used to run these challenges and also brought a lot of uh, very uh, great data for these uh, challenges. Um, so there's other fields, KDD, CASP, and so on. So other crowdsource challenges stream is by far not the only such initiative. But we are very focused on, on computational biology and uh, biomedical research. Um, so my role, uh, as I've been involved from the very beginning in DREAM, first as a participant, and then I've been involved in conceiving and leading these challenges. And I'm really what I really like these challenges for the reason that I've mentioned before. But uh, what excites me most is that actually we can learn new, um, by, by integrating the predictions from the community, we can often derive a better, more accurate prediction that could have not have been done by any individual member. And that's the principle of the wisdom of crowds, which is another new idea already. Francis Galton, in 1907, um, explored this idea. He was on a market, and there was a competition where people could guess the weight of an ox. And he then found that the median prediction of the participants was actually very close to the true, true weight. And so we apply the same principle in, in these challenges. And in, in gene, in this shows results from this gene network inference challenge. I will not go into the details because this is published. Um, but uh, this shows the per performance of all the individual teams. And then the integrated community prediction achieved the best performance. And this is a theme we often see in these challenges and hope uh, maybe also in this new challenge. Um, and we will definitely explore this, uh, these community predictions. Um, so that was the introduction for to DREAM. Now I'll briefly uh, present our work on tissue-specific networks. There the motivation was that now we know uh, many genomic loci that are associated with complex diseases. But uh, we, making use of this data is difficult without understanding the, the networks and pathways that kind of sense and propagate these perturbations. So we need to unravel these uh, molecular networks um, and uh, to really have a chance to develop uh, novel and better targeted treatments. And of course, um, these networks are actually tissue specific. So these represent some different cell types and tissues. And, and there's a problem that existing pathway databases uh, largely lack tissue-specific information. So um, in this project, we wanted to basically show that by uh, deriving tissue-specific networks from uh, data, we can, we can uh, identify perturbed modules by genetic variants. And so again, I will just skip through this briefly, but we, we, um, we use data from the Phantom 5 consortium, and that's cache seek data, but basically it gives you activity uh, levels or expression levels for enhancer and promoter regions, so regulatory elements. So you can get similar data from similar uh, maps from epigenomic data, and you could use the same approach using epigenomic data. So we use this phantom data, and the, the cool thing is that this is available for 400 cell types and tissues. So it really covers the whole human, and it's all human data from this phantom 5 consortium. Uh, so we use these enhancer and promoter regions from phantom 5, and then link transcription factors to these regions using regulatory motif analysis. So transcription factor binding motifs in these regions, and then linked enhancers to target genes based on their proximity and joint activity in, uh, in a given tissue. So here you have a link because maybe this enhancer is close to that gene and they're both active. But if the gene is not active, obviously there is no link. So we used a, a quite parsimonious, quite simple approach to construct these networks, basically. So as a baseline, that maybe could be improved further on uh, uh, in the future. So we validated the networks by looking at the enrichment of motifs in these regulatory elements using ChIP-seq data to validate transcription factor regulatory element links, eQTLs to validate links from enhancers to target genes, and RNA-seq data to basically see if these uh, uh, networks also have a functional or are predictive of gene expression. So if the, the regulatory edges are also predictive of gene expression in independent RNA-seq data that was not used to construct these networks. Um, 
this just gives an overview of these networks uh, when, when we, we, we did a clustering of these networks. So here you have these 400 networks and, and you see that they really basically recapture the whole uh, human anat anatomy and, and, and nicely grouped by, by tissue type and, and, and function. So basically related lineages share regulatory components because these networks cluster together. So we use this cutoff here to create 32 clusters of networks and here you, we zoom in into two of these clusters and you see this is a cluster grouping together lymphocytes and uh, here um, myeloid leukocytes and you see that these clusters really very nicely group related cell types and and we also use these 32 clusters to create 32 high level networks so for each cluster we also create the network by taking the union of these networks so we also have a, a network for lymphocytes one for myeloid leukocytes and so on for each of these clusters. So then we tested whether these whether disease-associated genes are more densely interconnected in these networks than expected. And um, to do that, I compiled a, a large collection of GWAS datasets. So here we had about 40 GWAS datasets. I think these numbers are not, co not up to date anymore. And we then used our Pascal tool, which was also published this year, um, this method was developed by David Lamparter um, and together we developed a, a nice software tool where you can easily run this analysis. So if you have to compute gene level p-values from the GWAS data, this tool can easily do it. So just briefly, you have here the SNP p-values, so the genetic variants and their association to a given trait. And now we want to summarize this signal across a gene region. And the, the reason why this is difficult is because the SNPs are not independent, so they're correlated due to linkage disequilibrium, and this has to be taken into account in this type of analysis. So once we have gene level p-values, we can map them onto our networks. So this shows one tissue-specific network, and we can do this for each network, map them, map these values here, and then ask whether um, disease-associated genes are more densely interconnected than expected. Like here we see a module of genes that uh, tend, that is enriched for disease-associated genes, for example. And we, so we developed a pipeline where you can compute kind of a global enrichment value that shows whether the disease-associated genes are more densely interconnected than expected. And I'm just, I will just show one example, and um, that's for schizophrenia. We ran this analysis across the 32 high-level networks that I mentioned before, and you see that for brain tissue-specific networks, we found uh, the strongest enrichment, basically the only ones that passed the, the significance threshold, um, which of course makes sense for a psychiatric uh, disorder. But then the really uh, uh, surprising finding was that we could even zoom in and test each of the individual networks. So remember that these are these high-level clusters and each of them contains a bunch of networks. And if we now test each of the individual networks in here for enrichment, we, uh, we found that even at this very fine-grained resolution, we get very disease-relevant uh, tissues at the top. So, for example, we have here three structures that make up the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia modulate motor, cognitive, and emotional behavior and actually show pathological animals in patients and are the primary target of some antipsychotic drugs that are currently used to, to treat schizophrenia. So this shows that we can really, um, with this, in a, that the, the basically the, the GWAS variants perturb tissue-specific regulatory modules. And as we would expect, these modules are, very, are, are specific to the disease-relevant tissues. Um, so we made these networks uh, available um, on this uh, a website and, and again to summarize what's what's unique basically about this collection is that it covers so many tissues and also that the networks are basically very fine-grained that we really link promoters enhancers and gene isoforms and not just transcription factors target genes as often done in gene network analysis uh, I included the cover here that's actually not our our illustration that's a different uh, uh, pa paper that was in this issue but uh, it's very fitting, and I really like it, because it, it, it was actually Julio Sáez Rodriguez, who will be here uh, uh, next week. Uh, you should see his talk. 
Um, it was a paper where he was involved, uh, where they made this illustration basically showing Plato's cave. Uh, Plato's cave is an allegory where, uh, where he imagined us um, being prisoners in a cave and just observing the, the, the world through shadows projected on the wall of the cave. And of course, uh, for us computational biologists, this is really the same because we're trying to make inferences about the true nature of things just from basically their shadows in our uh, data, if you want. Um, so that was, uh, that was the brief, uh, uh, basically some, some highlights of this study on tissue-specific networks. But I want to now focus the rest of the talk on this, on this new work, this disease model identification challenge, and start with a brief introduction. Um, so what, first, what's a module or a pathway? Well, we can loosely define it just as a group of functionally related genes or proteins. And of course, most functions that we study in molecular biology uh, um, are actually involve multiple genes or multiple proteins. Uh, some traits uh, in, are defined by a single gene, but but uh, in most cases, we deal with multiple genes. And so these can be defined as modules or pathways. And so we often have data. And we want to know what are the genes involved in my process or disease of interest. And we, we can call that pathway analysis. If we really focus on identifying groups of genes. And again, so this is not just for human um, traits, but more generally in molecular biology, a, a very fundamental problem. And so uh, one approach is what I call pathway analysis here, is to start with pathways from curated databases and then test these pathways for enrichment in your data. So you have your data, for example, um, differentially expressed genes in your study, and you take pathway databases like Gene Ontology or CAG, and now you test these pathways for enrichment using methods such as gene set enrichment analysis. Um, that's, of course, a, a useful uh, analysis, but the limitation is that you're really relying on, your, on the existing known pathways. And, and we know that the, these pathway databases are definitely incomplete. And, and especially, as I mentioned before, they lack tissue and context-specific information often. And they're very uh, heavily biased towards well-studied genes or well-studied uh, model systems. So an alternative approach is network analysis where you build a network from your data, then identify network modules basically as a de novo way to predict pathways. So you, you build a network, and then you identify the modules in this network. And so this, this is the step that we call module identification. Um, and an example of this approach is weight the gene co-expression network analysis. It's not my favorite method, but it's, it's widely used. And uh, then you can analyze these modules, for example. You can then bring in pathway databases at this point and see uh, if, if, if they enrich for certain functions and annotate them. Uh, uh, but of course, the, the advantage using this approach is that we do not rely on known or fixed pathways, but we can actually discover novel pathways or expand existing pathways. And also, network data is now increasingly becoming available, so this becomes more relevant. Uh, uh, you know, as I've shown the, the networks that we had in the study that I presented before, but also, you know, novel um, experimental technologies now allow to, to really map also uh, transcription factor gene interactions with ChIP-seq or uh, protein interactions, high throughput, and so on. So there's more and more network data, and this type of approach is becoming very relevant. Um, so I want to now focus on the model identification step. I mean, we, we've, we've dealt with network inference in previous challenges. Um, but but uh, I was interested now in kind of comparing model identification methods. And model identification, or also called community detection more in the network science, is a very is a classic problem. And there's really, it's a huge field, hundreds of methods. You know, there's in, in physics, economics, social sciences, and so on. This is very relevant. Here we have an example. It's the Game of Thrones characters network. And the modules shown in color basically correspond to the novel houses of these different characters. But you can, of course, do this with Twitter networks and so on. So it's a very relevant problem. 
But here we were more specifically interested in, bio in, in applications to biological data. And the problem is the performance, basically, what, what are the best methods to identify biologically relevant modules? That's really not well understood. And of course, I, this is obviously would be a great dream challenge, I thought. And for several years, I kind of thought about this. But the, the key problem is, of course, how to assess these modules, because there's really no gold standard experiment uh, where you could experimentally test or validate the module. So this is a difficult question. And um, uh, previous studies, mainly they mainly use artificial benchmark networks. So you can use these stochastic block models, where you have an edge probability matrix to generate the network, basically just the probability of nodes that are in the same module, like these here, that is higher than for nodes that are in different modules. And you can generate uh, benchmark networks like this. You can uh, generate them with different structures. Like here, they have different sizes for these um, communities. So you can try to make them more realistic. But of course, in the end, the biological networks still, they, they will never really follow this stochastic block model. Um, so another approach is to use uh, metadata, so metadata that would be labels on the nodes of the network um, in addition to the, the edges. So you, you use the metadata to validate the community. So this is a classic example, is this karate club, um, where these were members of this karate club, each node, and the interactions are social, the links are social interactions. And then when you run community identification, you get these two communities. And th that actually corresponds to two fractions that emerged when this, th there was a disagreement in this club and it split up. And, and you recover this with the community detection methods. But of course, usually we don't know the true community structure. Um, so you can use other metadata, like in the Game of Thrones network, you could use the noble houses of the characters. In genomic networks, we usually use geo annotations or pathway annotations. So you can see if, if a module enriches for a, for a known pathway, a gene ontology category or something like that, you, uh, you could say this module is validated or supported. We have some evidence that it might be function, a functional module. Now, now, of course, this has the limitations that I mentioned before of pathway databases. They're incomplete and so on. And so our idea was to use GWAS data, which is a novel approach to really to, to <coughs> validate uh, really with the goal to validate module, uh, module identification methods. But it has very nice um, properties. Uh, so the GWAS really provides a genome-wide unbiased functional annotation of your genes, if you want. Because it's really an experiment that is genome-wide, and it doesn't focus just on well-studied proteins or genes, right? And, and so you get for every region, you get really a, a score that's the association to the trait of the GWAS, and it's, done, it's available for all genes. And now also we have more and more GWAS data becoming available, so now there's really hundreds of traits. We collected 256 GWAS data sets. So this covers a lot of basically pathways or functional units, and many of which may not have been annotated previously, right? And, and, and because they may be from brain tissues or so that they're not often studied. And so the idea is we have our modules and now we test them for enrichment in the GWAS data. You have here a module that's enriched uh, because you see here it, it has many uh, trait associated genes. And this can be done with the Pascal tool. As I mentioned, you can use Pascal to uh, compute the gene p value, so to summarize the, 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 the SNP. SNP uh, association scores at the level of genes, but you can also use it to summarize them at the level of gene sets or pathways. So now we have as input the gene set, the GWAS, and also um, the 1000 genomes reference uh, uh, just for the LD structure down here. And uh, that, that's used to correct these scores um, correctly. And now we, we compute the gene score for every gene. And for neighboring genes, we can treat them as a, as a single unit. We can kind of merge them, and, and, uh, which is important because they're not independent because of the linkage to equilibrium. And many tools ignore this. And then you get the inflation of the p-values. So you compute the gene scores or the metagene scores. And then you compute a module enrichment p-value. And now we can compute an, uh, 
score at the level of module that basically shows us the association of that module to the trait. And so Sarvenas uh, did uh, uh, actually was did, did most actually also on the on the results that I will show now she did the, the biggest part of this work so um, and and she did the, also the initial exploratory analysis to see if that actually works and and so this is, was one of the first results and one of the first things she explored was she just took pathways from known databases and tested them for enrichment right and then she counted how many pathways you get for each GWAS trait. So that's shown here in blue. And you see that for some GWAS traits, you actually get lots of relevant pathways in the, in the pathway databases. And these are actually, it's probably too small to read, but these are all immune-related traits. So it seems for that, the uh, pathway databases have good coverage. But then she um, also did basically the same approach, but with gene sets derived from networks, so she applied some standard modular identification methods um, to a network collection that I will show you on the following slides. Um, so she had a bunch of network derived modules and tested those for enrichment and again checked which traits you know, give significant hits and you see that for many traits, basically these network modules, we can get significant um, uh, modules where the pathway databases did not give any hits and especially uh, you see here many uh, psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and so on, which, which have zero hits in this pathway database. So this was very encouraging and we thought, okay, we, this, we, we have to go for this challenge because um, uh, this really has huge potential to discover novel pathways, especially if we crowdsource this, because this was just kind of off-the-shelf methods, a kind of quick and dirty analysis, but now we wanted to comprehensively uh, try to get the best pathways from the community. So now we'll describe this module identification challenge and, and the results because it just closed two weeks ago. So this is very fresh. We really just we just announced the best performers uh, like last uh, two weeks ago. So I will briefly describe the challenge setup and then these first results and the best performing methods. Okay, so the network collection. Uh, we have six networks in this challenge, and two are protein interaction networks, including a string uh, network. Uh, so we have a Swiss quality network in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. We should have a... <laughs> for the next edition, we will get one from here. Um, and, and then a signaling network provided by Julio, who will be here, as I mentioned, and the co-expression network and a kind of a cancer codependency network and the homology-based network. And so these are correlation networks, these two here, the, the co-expression and cancer codependency network. And the others kind of have a confidence score on the edges um, that's based on you know, the evidence that supports these edges. So these are more like curated databases. And so they're all weighted, the networks, undirected, except for the signaling network, which is directed. And they're quite diverse. As you can see, they vary in size, also in structural properties that's not shown here, but they have different degree distributions and so on. So I think this is nice as a benchmark because we want to have a diverse collection of networks. Um, they are all unpublished or custom versions. For example, from String, we removed all the literature mind interactions. So basically that they're not publicly available in the form as they were included in the challenge. So this allowed us to anonymize the network, so to remove the gene labels and just number the nodes. And the, the participants got the networks only in this anonymized form, so they could really not use any additional data. That they just had to look at the network topology, the network structure, and derive modules only by looking, only based on uh, topology information. So uh, the, we uh, organize, we, we decided to have two sub-challenges. The first is really classic module identification. So you have the network and you, you identify modules, groups of genes, for each network individually. And sub-challenge two, we had the six networks aligned, so basically that the same node, if, if it was the same gene in one network and the other, they are assigned the same anonymized label, so the same number, so they're aligned. So that participants could actually use 
the networks together to, to derive potentially more accurate modules. Uh, you will see how that worked out. <laughs> um, and so these are the two sub-challenges. Then the modules had to be non-overlapping. And, and the number of modules could vary, so they could decide how many modules they want to submit and the size of the modules, that's not fixed. Except that we put a limit to 100 genes, because really if you have modules of several hundred genes, it's just not biologically very useful anymore. Even 100 genes is pretty big. Um, so they had this constraint, and <laughs> not all genes had to be included. But we thought if, if, you know, if a gene doesn't fit in any module, we don't want to force the participants to assign uh, that gene to a module. And that's not, so these, these are two interesting points because that's not typical for classical module identification oh. methods. So basically off-the-shelf methods had to be, mod, um, had to be kind of uh, modified a bit to, to accommodate these, uh, 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 these points. And then the score was simply the number of modules showing, so uh, given submission of a team, which is looked how many modules show enrichment in at least one GWAS data set. Of course, we, we um, corrected for multiple testing based on the number of modules that are in the submission. So if you submit few modules, um, uh, well, you, you have fewer chances to get a significant hit. But if you, if you submit more modules, you also have a higher multiple testing burden. So it's kind of a, a trade-off uh, that, that, that uh, anybody would also face when applying these methods in, in practice. Um, so you see that if multiple GWAS showed enrichment in the same module, it still only counted once, and that's because these GWAS are often related. For instance, the same module might show enrichment typically in several of these uh, immune-related GWAS, and so we counted only once. Um, so the structure of the challenge is basically first there's a training phase, which we call the leaderboard phase, and then there's a final submission. So, and so for the leaderboard phase, the teams could basically make submissions and then see how well they did. And, and they were limited to 20 submissions because it's computationally intensive, as I will show. And for this leaderboard phase, we used 76 GWAS datasets. And then after that leaderboard phase, they had to make a final submission. And for that, we used 104 GWAS datasets, which are uh, different, of course, from these. And also, I did an analysis um, to see that they are not correlated with these GWAS datasets, basically that related traits are not are either all in, in this set or all in this set, that they're really independent sets. So we really have a, a good holdout data sets. Uh, so the, how this was done logistically, so we, as I mentioned from Sage BioNetworks, we have the Synapse platform, which is a collaborative platform. Um, where that is now used to run these challenges where teams can register and access the data. There's a wiki discussion forum, and then they can make submissions and see their score on a kind of a real-time leaderboard. And, and uh, the scoring was done here on the Vital IT cluster. And so um, Robin uh, was very helpful in, in helping us to set this up and, and, and we set up an automatic system that kind of, uh, we, I should say, Sarvenas, I should say Sarvenas really did uh, all of um, uh, the bulk of this work. And um, the system then allowed to grab the, uh, the, the submissions from the Synapse platform, score them on Vital IT and update the scores in the leaderboard. And as I said, it's really intensive. So we had one submission means that uh, GWAS pathway analysis on six networks times 76 GWAS datasets. So we had 400 plus jobs just for one submission. And during the leader forward phase, we, we actually ran over 400,000 jobs. Each job was actually quite short, only like five minutes. So it was feasible, but still uh, very challenging. And um, just a brief note, because people sometimes ask, oh, why, why would people actually participate in these challenges? So an important part of these challenges are the incentives. And we did a survey, what's the most important incentive? And the most important is publication opportunities, as, as uh, you might have guessed. And, and the thing is uh, that the participants actually get to be consortium co-authors. I mean, we, here we said that they have to outperform some off-the-shelf baseline methods to basically at least ensure that you don't can't just submit a random prediction and be on the paper, but 
basically all the participants that do a serious effort, they get to be consortium co-authors, and, and the best performers may be future, featured more prominently on the author list, depending on how important their method becomes in the paper. And, and we have a partner journal always for this, which this year, this, for this challenge is cell. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's accepted that, uh, I mean, the paper has to undergo standard peer review pr process, but at least they show interest. And, and this, of course, helps to, to drive participation. Also, they can write companion papers and submit, I mean, they can submit anywhere if they want to, but we have a partnership with F1000 Research, which is a great uh, kind of a new model uh, for publication. Um, so access to unpublished data is, is another important motivation, and of course also they can be invited then to give a talk and get a travel grant. The conference is very soon in Phoenix, so if you want to visit the Grand Canyon, you can still register at com. Um, so the participation, uh, we had 400 registered participants, and then usually some drop out or don't get to make submissions. In the end, we had 42 teams with final submissions. That means 42 teams that also submitted detailed methods, descriptions, and code. And that's all already, mo most already available pre-publication. Especially the best performers, they are public. The teams can choose if they want to make it public already or not at this point. Uh, sub to 32 teams and the forum, very active participation. And this is really great that you get a very active uh, uh, discussion. It's also um, a bit exhausting sometimes, <laughs> but it's really valuable because we get a lot of valuable input really early on in this project. And, 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 and some you know, very, very smart people who participate in these challenges and start to, to see potential issues with the scoring method and so on. And indeed, we did discover a bug like after the first week. And, and had to change something with the background set used for enrichment computation and so on. So it's, it's a kind of pressure to have uh, basically over 100 um, people working with your, your data and your, your scripts and, and, and potentially finding bugs. Um, but but uh, it's, it's really valuable input that, that we got. So these are the results for sub-challenge one. You see that we have two teams that tie with a score of 60. Um, so that's overall six networks. And we did a kind of a bootstrap analysis to find to see if these what's the if these differences are significant, and or you know how how um, how often basically a team if you if you kind of vary the GWAS data set a bit if that ranking changes. So we subsampled 76 GWAS data sets out of the 104. That's the number of GWAS data sets that was in the leaderboard set, so that's why this number. Uh, did that a thousand times and computed this base factor, which basically just, um, well, it just boils down to, to saying how many times a given team was better or equal than the best performer. And, and that this base factor of three, which we defined as a tie, if it's smaller than three, that means that a team outperforms the best performer one out of four times if you do the subsampling. And you see here in purple, these are basically the ties. But, so this, actually, when we looked at um, other FDR cutoffs, so this shows the results at 5%, we actually found here it looks quite close. But if you kind of look at different cutoffs, and also on the leaderboard she was set, and um, we see actually a clear best performer was this team task, which show, had the most robust performance. Basically, the, the ranking of the other teams was not very stable, but they were just first always. And also on the leaderboard, she was set, and also in sub challenge two, they had good performance. Then we had a, a bunch of teams that also did well and quite competitively, I would say, with this team. Um, this team Aleph and six others, depending on the color for you. <laughs> So we said this tied for second place. Um, now, if you look across the networks, uh, it doesn't look so pretty anymore. So here we have the overall score. And then this is the scores on each of the networks. And basically, in purple are the top performers on each network. And you see that it, there's a lot of variability. Um, if you look a bit closer, actually, the top performer did pretty well on the protein interaction networks. Best top here and top here. So signaling and protein interaction, and also here it's actually 
ranked uh, the third rank. So it seems the top performer is actually quite doing quite well on the protein networks. But um, other methods actually do better on the co-expression network. So um, also on the networks, we see that the string actually led to the most disease modules, followed by the co-expression network. Um, so this looks very promising for the community predictions, which hopefully will make this more robust. So we, I don't yet have results for community predictions because it's quite tricky to 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 do that to to build a community prediction from these modular identification methods. I do have a slide on that in the end. Um, as our performance also varies across the leaderboard, so the training set and the holdout set. Except the best performer again was quite robust, but other teams vary quite a bit. Me, uh, suggesting that they may be overfitted on the training data. So just very briefly, the best performers, so it's this uh, Jake, Lenore, and uh, colleagues from Tufts University. And their underlying idea of their methods is that basically genes connected by path through low degree genes have high similarity. So protein networks are small world. A small world network means that the path between any two nodes is typically short because there are hubs that connect many nodes. And uh, of course, if you connect it through a high degree node, so a knob, hub, uh, that doesn't mean much. Um, it's like if Diana and I both follow Justin Bieber on Twitter, that doesn't say much. But if we both follow Johannes, that says much more about uh, our social network, right? Um, so this is similar, in this. so this is the Justin Bieber network uh, node here. Um, so the, the metric they use is diffusion state differences based on a random walk, and basically a spectral metric that's uh, based on the expected number of times that a random walk connects two genes. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a metric that they actually developed um, this team, I mean, that's not the case for all teams. Often they use also uh, published methods, off-the-shelf methods, and so on. But that's actually a team who is very active in the field and used their method and improved it for this challenge. Uh, they, they developed another method to compute this uh, diffusion state difference more um, efficiently. And then they clustered this similarity matrix with the standard clustering algorithm. They also used another interesting strategy, and we don't know yet the contribution of this. this they also looked for dense bipartite graphs. Uh, so that's basically when you have two sets of nodes and many links between these two sets. And, and they found a few pathways in this way and then merged that with them. So most, the, most of their modules are from this approach, but then they added some dense bipartite graphs. We don't know yet how important that was for their overall performance. But it's an interesting idea that basically you need different methods, again, of course, hinting that community predictions will be interesting, that you may need different methods to capture different types of uh, modules. Uh, OK, so sub-challenge two will be more quickly. So uh, this shows the results for the teams in sub-challenge two. And in sub-challenge two, so that was the multi-network predictions, right? And we used as baseline, we used the single network predictions because, and that uh, led to also some discussion on the forum, because of course it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to beat. Uh, if we, so we said, okay, as a, as a baseline, we take the, the predictions of single networks from this team task, which was the team that performed best on the leaderboard set. So we don't, we didn't look at the final data, but it was also the best on the final data. Basically, we chose the best method on the leaderboard and took the single network prediction. And you see that some of them tie with the multi-network prediction. So basically, and it's that's just an example with this baseline here. But this was a we realized this already during the leaderboard phase that basically it's extremely hard to outperform the single network predictions according to this metric with these multi-network predictions. Of course, initially we would have thought that you would get much higher scores if you add all this information from the different networks. But it seems it's very difficult to actually make use of that, uh, of these complementary networks in the multi-network prediction. And, and so we declared that there was no winner in this challenge. Just an honorable mention for the highest score goes to this team from the Riken uh, Center in Japan. Um, 
they basically merged the two protein networks. They didn't use all the other networks, and that's also telling that the method that actually didn't only use two of the six networks did best. Um, and it's the two protein interaction networks, so it's basically similar information. Um, they merged these networks, and then they used the standard uh, clustering algorithm with Luvan, which is a uh, really state-of-the-art algorithm. And, and um, yeah, this shows the Luvan algorithm. I will not explain this here. But yeah, they got a good score like this, but again, they didn't really substantially outperform predictions from single networks. So I, I finish with the outlook. Um, we will have to, so as I said, I mean, this is really just a result from the last week, so we didn't yet have time to do everything we want to do. Obviously, we want to give a better overview of all the different approaches that were used and how well they did, and um, generate community predictions. Uh, we're currently thinking how to do that, but the basic approach is we can build a change in similarity matrix where an entry says how many times a pair of genes was actually put in the same modules by teams. And you can, of course, weight teams in different ways, or you could do it unweighted, and, and then run a clustering algorithm on this similarity matrix. That's the basic approach we plan to do. And then, of course, we have to look at, actually, these modules and, and make some, gain some biological insight and, make an, and hopefully maybe follow up on some of these predicted disease pathways, even uh, with experimental collaborators. OK, so I've given you a, a brief uh, um, introduction to what these dream challenges are. I've shown you some of, of highlights of our tissue-specific networks, and, and then presented you this new disease model identification challenge, which is really a new type of dream challenge, I would say, that there were no model identification challenges before. And it's also new in the sense that the scoring it's usually it's just based in these challenges, it's usually based on a holdout data set, and it's quite easy because you can just compute a correlation or an area under the curve uh, to see how well the predictions were by just comparing them directly to the holdout data. But here, uh, the, the evaluation was actually based on this GWAS pathway analysis, which, which is actually a very um, which is a, a very intricate analysis to do and a computationally intensive analysis. So this brought many challenges, but, but I hope will, will lead to hopefully interesting uh, results now when we look at these uh, modules that were submitted by these, these teams. Um, so I would just like to finish by thanking again, first of all, Sarvenas, who really worked, uh, as I said, she really did the majority of this work, actually, um, uh, with the scoring and, and the exploratory analysis to even see if this challenge was feasible. Of course, Sven, our advisor, who, who was actually very active in in, particip in, in, in helping defining uh, these, these scoring metrics and so on, and Sultan was very helpful in GWAS-related questions. David, who developed the Pascal tool, again, without this, without the Pascal tool, we could not have done this because other tools for GWAS pathway analysis would be uh, not fast and efficient enough to, to do this at this scale. It would have been completely impossible. Uh, Gustavo and Steven from uh, the Dream Challenges, and, and Julio, who, who started to, uh, 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 is, is, is the cha uh, challenge director, actually, and involved now also in the analysis of the results. Of course, Vital IT and Sage Bionetworks for the uh, infrastructure, computing infrastructure. Thanks. <laughs>